just say next slide, please. Okay. Uh, right. Well, um, as uh, as you'll appreciate, we had a variety of unexpected technical difficulties there, which appears by a certain amount of improvisation to have overcome. Uh, so, I'm uh, I'm Clive Davenhall, a uh, member of the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you uh, nothing, nothing at all serious, um, no serious astronomy, just a bit of fun about a short uh, German science fiction film from uh, probably from 1941, uh, which was called Spaceship One Launches. So if we have, uh, I should say, I'm, uh, I'm not, not actually in Edinburgh, if we go to the next slide. I'm actually uh, actually sending this from Stone in Staffordshire, where I've been uh, been since the start of lockdown. I look like staying for a while till we're let out. So next slide. So this is uh, it is Spaceship One launches. Next slide. Uh, it's a as I said a short German film, probably released in 1941. Some sources vary. Some say 1940, but f probably 41. Uh, it's uh, usually described as a culter film or documentary, though the subtitle given to it, a technical fantasy, is as good a good a description as any. And it's not obviously not really a documentary. Uh, and these uh, short documentaries were shown uh, in German cinemas um, either before or after the the main feature, uh, just to uh, bulk the program out a bit. And basically, Spaceship One launches, imagines the first manned flight to the moon, which was launched on 1960, in, uh, allegedly launched, launched in 1963, which was the, or would have been the 60th birthday of the uh, director of the film, Anton Kuta, uh, who mostly made documentaries and also was a lifelong amateur astronomer. Uh, it's possible that some of you have heard of him, uh, though I'd, uh, I'd not before I stumbled across uh, Spaceship One. Uh, obviously the film was made during the war and it was largely cobbled together with footage um, that had already been shot for a couple of films that were in progress when uh, the war broke out and they were canceled. Though fairly obviously some of the shot footage was shot for it. So next slide. Uh, as I say, it was uh, directed by Anton Kuta, who also wrote the screenplay, uh, and it was made by Bavaria Film uh, in Munich. Uh, in 1939, uh, Bavaria Film had started wor work on another science fiction film, Incident in Space, which is one of the ones that uh, got, got cancelled. And uh, uh, the other film by a different studio, U UFA, the famous UFA studios, was Spaceship 18, uh, but both were both were cancelled. Spaceship One launches probably contains material from Incident, incident in Space, uh, given they came from the same studios, uh, unless surely from uh, Spaceship 18. And on the on the right there, there's a poster I found for Spaceship 18, and that that spaceship definitely doesn't appear in Spaceship One. So next slide. Uh, Kuta. Uh, born in 1903, uh, died in 1985, uh, worked all his life as a director and screenwriter, uh, started with um, uh, the German film company Arthur Bohm, uh, later worked for Bavaria Film, and as I say, he mostly worked on documentaries, uh, and he continued to work after the war well into the, into the 1950s, and I got that uh, partial filmography uh, there from the BFI, uh, with a collection of uh, a collection of films I never heard of. So if we have the next next slide. Uh, also, and interestingly enough, he was also a lifelong amateur astronomer, and this I think shows in the film uh, with the, a degree of technical accuracy. Uh, apparently, like like many of his, his his interest started quite early in life. Uh, when at age 12, he made his own telescope from a spectacle lens and a toy projector. Uh, <clears> then <throat> he studied um, studied engineering, uh, got an engineering degree before starting work as a film director or in the film industry. 
Uh, but shortly after having graduated, he worked for a couple of years uh, in, in the, as a volunteer, I assume, in the Stuttgart Pog uh, Popular Observatory, which had recently opened. It actually opened uh, in 1922. Uh, Wikipedia is my friend. Uh, and I assume the sort of thing they would be doing there is the sort of thing that both the um, ROE and the ASC do from time to time, the public outreach sessions and public observing and that, that sort of thing. Uh, Kutu is mostly remembered uh, amongst astronomers uh, for developing the uh, so-called Kuta telescope, which was, I must admit, again, I'd not heard of, uh, but basically it's a, an oblique mirror te telescope. I'm not going to try to pronounce the, uh, the German name. Uh, basically, it was a, a, an oblique, uh, oblique secondary. Uh, so the secondary is moved out of the, out of the um, uh, light path uh, to the primary, so it doesn't occlude any of the, any of the primary mirror, which obviously is a is an advantage. Um, next slide. Uh, that's uh, that was a booklet he wrote on the Kuta telescope. Uh, and next slide. That's the uh, <coughs> that's the observatory he established in Beerbach. Uh, <coughs> the the family, well, particularly his wife's family, uh, were um, um, cinema impresarios. They owned a cinema or a couple of cinemas, uh, and the uh, the observatory was built on top of the family cinema. Uh, as far as I know, it's still there. So um, that was that was Kute. Next slide. Um, Spaceship One um, was just a, a short 20 minute film and there's not a, a great deal of plot. It's not, not a movie in the, in, in the normal sense. It's basically a technical, fan, technical fantasy about uh, the first flight to the moon. It starts with a, a lecture given by the designer of the uh, spaceship and a press conference. And given this is all taking place in, in 1940 or 41, it's actually quite uh, <laughs> quite surprising uh, to see, in a way, to see the press conference all being recorded with television cameras and so forth. But of course, television did exist before the war. Um, uh, and after the, the the press conference gives Kutu a, a chance to, to uh, well pad it out basically with lots of photographs of the development of uh, of aviation and aircraft, and you can see one of them on the back there. Uh, if there are any aviation buffs watching the watching the uh, documentary, you can amuse yourself and, and identifying the planes. Uh, then there's a launch sequence, which is really quite uh, impressive and well done, followed by the, the flight to the moon. Uh, <clears throat> the flight to the moon is tracked by a series of optical telescopes of increasing size. Uh, and again, um, you can uh, you can amuse yourself by trying to identify the identify the telescopes. Um, there's also another slight peculiarity in that um, uh, some of the um, telescopes, I assume, in Germany or the occupied powers, have um, uh, moving shots with a, the telescope being moved and so forth. But the the uh, larger American telescopes in California are uh, are fairly obviously stills that are being panned around for. For obvious reasons. Uh, spaceship One orb or orbits the moon and once it gets to the moon there's a, um, uh, a an entirely fictitious telescope, uh, a German telescope uh, uh, on what appears to be Kilimanjaro and apparently, I don't speak German, but apparently there's a reference in the soundtrack to the German colonies in East Africa and that's that's the closest the film actually comes to the propaganda. But this, uh, this, this fictitious telescope is a, I mean, I won't spoil it by showing you a picture of it, but it's a, uh, it is a thing to behold, shall we say. It's really quite, <laughs> it's quite remarkable. Um, and then having orbited the moon, rather than the same sort of path as Apollo 8, uh, Spaceship One returns to Earth. And that basically is it. Um, there are various um, peculiarities, which are obviously caused by the, um, uh, by the, the constraints of using found footage 
and repurposing things and not having a large a large budget to uh, shoot their own footage. So there are no actual uh, scenes inside the spaceship, um, not in, in scene, not inside proper. There is the 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 pilot um, does actually give a, a television broadcast at one point. We see him in his uh, in his console, but um, that's the closest it comes to being inside the spaceship. Uh, and there's no lunar landing, uh, just an orbit, and that's that again is obviously designed to be around the footage they've got. Uh, it would be a bizarre decision to make it, uh, for a, a, a film you are plotting without constraints. So next next slide. The launch sequence, and you can see bits of it here, is one of the um, one of the most impressive bits of the film. Is the the spaceship this famous 1930s teardrop shaped spaceship moves out of uh, out of its uh, its hangar uh, and launches as um, uh, as was often imagined at the time on a, a launch rail, an inclined launch rail, which you can see towards the bottom there. But the, the shots of it moving out of the hangar uh, are um, um, really quite impressive and the, the crowd, massed crowd scenes as they get out of the way, it's, it's really quite, a, quite good. If we have the next slide, the, uh, the, the hangar is, and indeed to, to a point, the spaceship, is obviously inspired by uh, Zeppelins and the Zeppelin works uh, close by Lake Constance. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, it's, well, it's fairly obvious just by looking at the two pictures, uh, the, the similarity. So next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, then uh, the, the film proceeds with a flight to the moon and lunar orbit. Uh, and some of these special effects are extremely well done for the time. Um, I, mean, I have to, up to a point, I have to stress this is for the time, but they are really quite, quite impressive, particularly the one on the top, um, top left there, uh, as the, the um, sun moves out from behind the earth. And uh, in the, in the film, the spaceship also, uh, also emerges. That's really quite an effective scene. Uh, and similarly on the, on the right there, the, uh, the spaceship approaching the moon. So these are, these are all uh, well worth seeing. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, I'll just say a, a few words comparing uh, Spaceship One with uh, another German science fiction film from about 10 years earlier, uh, Fritz Lang's uh, Woman in the Moon, Frau in Mond, uh, which is often called the first attempt at real, realistic uh, science fiction, certainly realistic space flight. It had um, Herman Oboth and Willie Lee as scientific advisors, who of course were um, prominent figures in the German Rocket Society before the war. And it had the, um, well, not the, 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 not, the not, not unique um, uh, uh, credit of being banned by the Nazis. Uh, in, this, in this case, because they were worried about it giving away secrets of their uh, rocket from the V2 program. So we have the, the next slide. Uh, what we can see here is the launch sequence or the moving out of the, uh, moving out of the, um, the hangar for Woman in the Moon. Uh, and there are a number of, well, scientifically accurate features which impressed me in it, in that before the manned flight, there was the unmanned photographic reconnaissance flights uh, which again isn't something that happens often in science fiction, but uh, it did here, which was was impressive. Uh, uh, excuse me. The rocket was assembled and launched vertically in the way that rockets have been. Uh, rockets are, and also it was a multi-stage rocket, uh, which stages as it leaves the Earth's atmosphere. And there was also late, later on, as they went in transit, there was a simulation of weightlessness. So that was really all quite. Um, quite serious attempts at scientific accuracy. But on the other hand, it's a movie and they had to tell a story. Uh, and uh, well, there was a sabotage, uh, sabotage uh, attempt and the false, forced landing on the far side of the moon, at which point the scientific accuracy goes out of the window when they find a breathable atmosphere. Next slide. 
uh, which uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, all pretense of scientific accuracy has gone out of out of the uh, the window there. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so that's that's uh, a compar brief comparison with woman in the moon. Next slide. Uh, I'll also just say a few words about the the inclined launch rail, um, which was a common idea in pre-war science fiction. Uh, and in speculation about space flight. And I've just put on the slide there a couple of cover illustrations from a, a book by another science fiction book by another German science fiction author in which the, uh, the author has, uh, they, well, the artists have um, uh, drawn rockets launching on launch, launch rails. Um, uh, Gail, I should say, was actually a member of the German Rocket Society uh, and a friend of Herman Oberth and Valier. <clears throat> um, I must be looking at those two pictures. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I'd like to be uh, like to be one of the crowd in the uh, in the right hand one, uh, uh, launching launching that uh, that uh, that close to crowds in the middle of a city doesn't seem a terribly good idea. But uh, obviously, they didn't care about uh, um, they didn't care about health and safety either. The, the launch rail in the country on the other other front cover is seems much more uh, sensible. Um, but these these launch rails uh, again appeared in science fiction um, um, in the in the early days of the space age. There's there's a fairly well known American science fiction film when worlds collide uh, made in 1951, which has um, has a launch rail sequence. Uh, uh, and in, and indeed, I uh, I really hesitate to mention this to an august body like the uh, Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, but uh, um, Fireball XL5 also had a uh, that Jerry Anderson, uh, Jerry and Silver Andes Anderson cartoon, also had a um, uh, <coughs> um, uh, launch rail sequence. Uh, possibly the last time, uh, last last time uh, it's going to be mentioned in the. ASE. I just had a message popping up saying oh, someone else was a fan. So next slide. Uh, yes, and these launch rails occasionally, uh, the idea of them occasionally surfaces again, though whether they would actually work, I I've, I've just don't, don't know. It's an uh, engineering problem. So next slide. So just to wrap up, uh, Spaceship One it really is an oddity in the history of movie science fiction. There are obvious compromises in the plot in that there isn't actually much of a plot, just a, a launch in an orbit of the moon um, and a fair bit of padding, but uh, re reasonably interesting padding. Um, this is co caused by the, well, the obvious constraints of existing footage, a limited budget and wartime constraints. But the, the special effects um, are very impressive for the, again, for the time, I have to emphasize it's for the time, but for the time they are very, very impressive. And the, the film only lasts about 20 minutes and is well worth a look. And so if we go to the last slide, I've put there, uh, well, three URLs um, uh, that you can uh, uh, access to uh, to watch the film, um, uh, and you can also allegedly buy a D DVD from the American National Archives, though they got the title wrong and uh, the date wrong, and it is rather pricey. Um, it's about fifty quid uh, on Amazon for uh, well for a twenty minute DVD. So yeah, I, <laughs> um, I've not uh, not bought a copy, so I, it's entirely adequate to watch it to uh, watch it on. Uh, online on YouTube. Uh, there's no need to dash, a, dash around scribbling down these URLs um, on the ASE's uh, webpage and, uh, announcing this talk. Uh, I've got a, a little a PDF you can download with active links to all these uh, URLs and a couple of others. Um, so, uh, so that's me. Um, I would recommend you go and, go and when you have a spare 20 minutes, go and watch Spaceship One launches. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Clive. Um, sorry. Very good. Thank you. It, it took a while to get there, but we got there in the end. Yes, we got there. <laughs> we, we got there in the end, though. 
It's no always idea. good to have a plan B. Yes, um, yes. I noticed that the um, the ROE had ex a, a not dissimilar problem about a, a fortnight ago with their talk. Oh, and, right. And uh, ended up saying they would hold another copy of the presentation somewhere just in case. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Any questions? Yeah, one for me, Peter, Clive. There's a remarkable similarity between Spaceship One and Elon Musk's Starship One. Uh, yes. They're exact, more or less the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, the the shape is kind of similar. Yeah. Um, actually, I didn't have, I didn't put it in the presentations. Um, but I found on the uh, on the internet a movie poster for Spaceship One that had been signed by the all the original crew of uh, Starship One. All right. I was just going to say, Clive. Um, of course, that launch rail concept was actually used for the German V one rockets. Yeah. They, well, they weren't really rockets, were they? They were pilotless planes. Yes, they actually, yes, they, yes, they, they went were. along a launch ramp like that, which is why the RAF spent a lot of time trying to blow them up in 1944-45. Yes, yes, in indeed, yes, they were launched from ramps. Yes, I'd, I'd forgotten that. Though, of course, the, the V-1 was a, an aircraft, not a spacecraft. Yeah. Yes, I say it's a pilotless aircraft, but um, that was sort of a very similar concept, which is quite yes. interesting that the Germans actually let it out. Because obviously they, it took the um, RAF quite a long time, photo interpreters quite a long time to actually identify these. So they, I think they called them ski ramps, um, which were scattered throughout yeah. sort of Holland and um, northern France, pointing at various bits of mostly the south of England. I guess Edinburgh was for, probably out of range. Yeah. <laughs> well, cheers, yes. Um, the, it's Sean here. I think the, what John was saying there, one of the I also commented on that in the in the comments section. I think it was Peter, yeah. Munda, which was the the research base in the north and the island off off the off the coast of Germany. And it just struck me, and I mentioned in the comments there, Clive. Um, I remember uh, uh, being quite young and 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 uh, being fascinated with the nineteen fifties US TV series of Flash Gordon. Um, I don't know if you recall that or ever watched it, but the the, the same zeppelin shape ship is actually used in that. It's quite similar. I wonder, um, it's interesting how much German cinema from the 20s to the 40s, certainly pre-World War II, went on to influence Western uh, American and British ideas of, of, of space travel before, before the actual era of space travel in the late 50s and 60s. Well, there were all sorts of connections. If, if you spend... Any amount of time looking at the uh, front covers of pre-war science fiction films, these teardrop-shaped, vaguely Zeppelinish uh, uh, spaceships are everywhere. They're all over the place. And again, something I, I forgot to, uh, or decided not to mention in the presentation, is that after the war, uh, the... Um, uh, some of the footage in Spaceship One was reused in an American uh, children's science fiction series. Uh, there is Flash Gordon's ship. <laughs> there is Flash, Flash Gordon's ship. Amazing. Yes. Although this one has strings on it. I never saw the strings as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Well, you don't see the strings in XL5 either. Um, but yeah, the, the footage from Spaceship One was reused, um, uh, reused in an American children's SF series. Uh, made in 1958 called Space Pioneers or Spaceship Pioneers. Um, so it would have been it would have been familiar to American audiences, but to the best of my knowledge, that was never shown in in uh, in the UK. So I was guessing that no one no one in the society would have heard of it. Yeah, it's interesting. But, uh, but yes, there, there are enormous enormous uh, lot of connections between the yeah. um, the VFR and what happened after the war. Yeah, sorry. That's right. I was, I was just going to say that um, uh, obviously the German influence on um, on on spaceflight and rocketry uh, continued with Werner von, von Braun, and uh, I think one of the um, uh, press asked him once, "Why are your rockets black and white?" And he said, "Because all rockets are black and white." 
and that was his uh, A4 yeah. V2. Yeah. So, um, even the even the color even the color they chose was yeah. in tradition with with what they'd used before. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, of course, the end of World War II, there was a great chase round, wasn't there, to oh, get yeah. rocket scientists amongst others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Americans ended up with Werner von Braun. I can't remember who the Russians ended up with. And we ended up with that engine that powered Black Arrow, that um, one that used high-test um, hydrogen peroxide and silver, I think, and a silver catalyst or something strange to power it. But I think that was basically goes back to some sort of German World War II development that never... Never got into a German rocket, but we we captured it. Gracious, I didn't. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's amazing. Clive, I had just one other question for you. I thought it was I wasn't aware of the. It's Sean Wixit here, by the way. I wasn't aware of the the um, uh, film by Rennie Lief, uh, Liefenstahl around uh, uh, Woman on the Moon. I think he yeah. said. Um, um, I suppose the thought that comes to my mind is that very early. French picture of 1903, uh, trip to the moon or day trip to the moon, which if I'm, I might be mistaken, but I think that only portrays men. Uh, it's interesting that you should have a film so early portraying a woman uh, a, undertaking space flight, albeit that, like you said, it veers off the scientific by finding a breathable atmosphere. But I just, I just thought that was very interesting that, that you know, so early on, you should have a, a major film industry like Germany portraying women in space. Uh, yes, yes. Um, Although the, the, the people who went up in that uh, French one you, were pretty indeterminate, some of them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the radiation, you know. <laughs> Going through the Van, Van Allen belts. <laughs> Excellent. Um, any more questions? Any more comments? I was just going to ask about the um, craters that showed up in one of the pictures. I wondered if they modelled them in Plaster of Paris or something. Like, was it Naismith who made the models of the moon in the 1800s out of Plaster of Paris? Uh, yes, it was Naismith, uh, well, James Naismith, um, who was an Edinburgh lad, of course. Uh, uh, yes, he, uh, uh, in later life, um, he took up studying the moon and there's a a famous uh, book that he wrote with Carpenter, where mm -hmm. in order to get accurate photographs, they, um, oh, or realistic photographs, they basically made these plaster of pa Paris models. Yes. He's not quite the only person to have done that. Uh, rather later in the 1920s and, well, 1910s up to 1930s, there was a, an amateur astronomer named uh, Scriven Bolton uh, from Leeds. Right. Mm. Um, who was, uh, had a parallel career as an astronomical artist sell, selling um, astronomical art to, uh, and right. with articles for, to mm. magazines and newspapers, things like the Illustrated London News. Uh, and apparently some of his, his uh, drawings of the moon he did with, um, from models he'd made. All right. It'd so yes, it's a, it's a well-known technique. It'd but be what, interesting what, to see one, but I don't know if any still exist. Uh, the Naismith ones, there's, they certainly still exist. Um, I've seen one in the Science Museum in London. Oh, right. Okay. Um, I think it might be on permanent display, but don't quote me on that. Can't remember last time I was there. It was a while ago now. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it'll be a while Free yet. Lockdown. Yeah, it'll be a while yet before we're left back in museums, I feel. Yeah. Well, with all the kids, it's going to be a big problem, isn't it? Yes. They run round like a like maniacs at the best of times. Yes. Perhaps we'll have adult only days. Oh, that was a bit <laughs> political, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that could be every day. <laughs> okay, is that um... evening? Evening all. Hi. Hi here. Uh, uh, hi Clive. Uh, hi. Sorry, I missed your talk. I've just finished work. Um, <laughs> I don't know if uh, you were all aware there was been uh, a rocket being tested up in Sutherland at the, the rocket site there uh, today, and also the HTV-5, no, number nine, the last of the starts to go up to the ISS, was launched successfully today and is in orbit. I think it's in its second orbit at the moment. But the, no. there was a new rocket being tested um, in Sutherland, so the yeah. first 
first time that's been done. Yeah, yeah. For many years. Yeah. yeah. So, John so, mentioned it earlier on. Right. Yes. This is the Some company us, that's in um, Lonehead. Some of us have to keep the country go running, you know. <laughs> um, but, and British Aerospace must have started building Skylarks again because they, they'd stopped. The program ended some years ago. It's, it's another company, apparently. Ah, it's another company. Called... I, don't, oh, I lost control of my mouse. I'll tell you if I could scroll the page down. It's Skyora, um, isn't it? Skyora, yes. Yes, yeah. they're, they're just around the corner from where I am in, in Lonehead. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait for the uh, bang. <laughs> they're, um, uh, where are they from? Um, it's a Russian, uh, one of the former Russian territories, I think. Um, most of the engineers have come across and the, the guy that runs it. Um, I mean, they were claiming that they get something like 10% of the vertical launch um, um, payloads from about the end of this year, but I've, I don't think they've launched anything yet. <laughs> uh, so They've got quite a nice website if you look for them. Sure, sure. Well, and the what are they going to launch? And the Skylark, the original Skylarks were suborbital, of course. Well, the, the, some of the small payloads and uh, um, sounding rockets and things like that, um, I guess. Uh, but yeah, look on the website. But they've yeah, got okay. ambitious plans. Okay. Um, at one time, we perhaps ought to think about getting them in for a talk, but uh, yeah. I think somebody suggested it might be a more of an advertising uh mission for them rather than a <laughs> <laughs> well yeah how and what because they yeah. want to keep it fairly close to their chest yes well, uh, I, don't, <clears throat> I, I don't know how well known this is but in the 1960s the roe flew um astronomical payloads in skylarks uh, yeah. for uh, for uh, ultraviolet astronomy and we we, we still have bits of Skylark in the uh, in the observatory, and there's a, there's a nose cone, uh, <laughs> and various bits of electronic, well, rather dated electronics that no one knows anything about. There's quite a lot in the science museum if you if we're ever allowed in there again. Um, there's actually, I think, one of the control consoles, and John Zarnicki, you remember, was involved in various missions to things. He, his PhD's in there um, because he wrote his PhD on them. Um, Something flown on Skylark. It's rather interesting when your PhD becomes a, a museum ex <laughs> exhibit, I think, before while well, you're still al alive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think actually one of the most powerful rockets ever launched from the UK soil was by, um, um, what's the rate of the, um, oh, the car show? I should top, 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 um, gear, top yes. gear, yes. They, they, launched, uh, they launched an old uh, uh, Reliant Robin. Yes. On top of a, um, a quite a sophisticated um, uh, rocket, which got it, got it up. But they didn't yes. fail to control it coming down. <laughs> but it was <laughs> one of the most powerful launches off, off UK soil. Yeah. Well, of course, the, all, the, all the Black Arrow ones were tested at the opposite end of the country, um, down on the Isle of Wight. Um, yeah. There's yeah. actually look, the remains of the launch site there. You can still, you could go and still go and see. It's a National Trust property. It's quite interesting because there's actually a couple of films about it they show you. And there's, um, I don't know if anyone knows anything about high test hydrogen peroxide, which is pretty nasty stuff to put it mildly. <laughs> and there's pictures of it coming across on the car ferry from Portsmouth. Um, you know, with all the other passengers and then <laughs> driving up through cows. And you think, hmm. <laughs> And we were told there by one of the people who used to work there that um, they used to keep a few th a thousand gallons of this high test hydrogen peroxide to test the rocket or to fuel the rocket during tests. And apparently someone's job every morning was to walk along, put his hand on the side of the, of the tank. And if it was getting hot, it was about to explode. And of course, one, one morning he walks along, this is definitely hot. <laughs> But they didn't seem to be a plan what to do with it, so they just opened the discharge tap and tipped it all down the chalk cliffs into the sea. And apparently there's some quite interesting things, and particularly if you're a rabbit fan, there weren't many rabbits left in the holes in the chalk after this had happened. Oh, until about 12 weeks ago, that was our national pandemic response plan as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, okay. 
think more we can, in control in Scotland than it is in England. I think we can turn the YouTube now off. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. Bearing in mind my surname, I'm no relation to her. 